Got it. Morning, everyone. Welcome to our Life Light Bible study on the life of David. It's great to all have you here. And uh, because we desperately need the Holy Spirit to be present among us, it's good to turn to Him and uh, of worship and prayer. So we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, Amen. We begin with our opening worship song. You have the sheet in front of you, hopefully. Oh God, our help in ages past. I did not realize this was the contemporary version. It's interesting, though. Something a little different. 
These are videos that are supplied by the Michigan District. Um, and they came about at the beginning of the pandemic for those that were struggling to have awareness and were doing just online worship and things like that. So uh, I haven't encountered any real contemporary versions. Uh, there was one other song. They had two different offerings of it on the website. And this, there's only one. So I to all of it. So that's interesting. Those of you that uh, like uh, really traditional work. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, do it on Sunday morning. We will, and that would be okay, wouldn't okay. it? Yes, sir. It would. We continue now with our time of worship with the, the responsive reading of Psalm 54. I'll put that on the screen. Oh God, save me by your name. Oh God, hear my prayer. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness put an end to me. With a free will offering I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble. And my eye has looked in triumph upon my enemies. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. O God, save me by your name. And to save me from your might. We pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we come before you seeking to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to do so through the study of your word. There's much we can learn from David's life. and We're thankful that he is presented to us in scripture as a human being who has shining moments, but then has moments where uh, he was faithless. And that's our lives, Lord. We have our mountaintop experiences, and then we dive down into the depths of woe and despair and unfaithfulness. Thank you, Jesus, for being a forgiving God that holds us up during those shining moments and then rescues us from those deep, dark pits. Continue to be with us. Heavenly Father, we believe that you are the God who can handle all adversity and all sins and, and all troubles in our lives. And so we turn these things over to you, trusting in your mercy. Lord, be with all those who are affected by the tornadoes in New Orleans and in Texas damage that has been done, Lord, work through the various means to restore them, lives lost, things lost, come alongside those people that are suffering. Lord, in your mercy, we, are, we give thanksgiving for a safe trip south and home for Tom and Sharon, for the relaxation that they had. Renew them in their, uh, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you would be with Jack and uh, that he would have good test results coming up and continue to be with Jill, that she would be strengthened uh, in all ways to stand by his side. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we're thankful that uh, Ellie is healing from his concussion, that uh, there doesn't appear to be any lasting consequences. Be with that man, uh, that he can continue to do and perform all of his various vocations. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, be with me. Grant me healing head to toe, body, soul, and spirit. Lift me up during this uh, difficult and busy time of the year that I might continue to be the shepherd of these people and preach your word to them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give thanksgiving, Lord, for successful surgery for our sister, Sue. Continue to be with her in her recovery and relieve her of the back pain she's been suffering. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanksgiving for Greg, that you kept him safe from that car accident uh, several months ago. We're thankful that his car is now ready. Just continue to watch over him and be with him. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, grant safety for our president as he travels abroad. And Lord, we ask that you would bring about a peaceful end to the war in Ukraine. Be with all of those who have been affected by it, and especially those refugees who have left their homes. Watch over them and keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with Charlotte <clears throat> as she needs healing from a cough and the other things that she's going through. Grant her complete recovery to health. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. 
Lord God, we thank you for the spring-like weather we are having. We ask that it would continue, that you would protect us from any adverse weather or strong storms that might head our way. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, we ask that you would be with Katie and that you would provide for her gainful employment at the place that you deem is best for her. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, be with Greg and Karen uh, as they go through remodeling at their house, that it would go well and it would be completed in a timely fashion. And that also Doreen's remodeling uh, of her bathroom would be completed in a timely fashion. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. All these things and those things that rest upon our hearts that maybe didn't get mentioned verbally, address those, Lord, according to your good and gracious will. Grant us patience to await the answer to these prayers. And all God's people respond. Amen. We pray now the collective today. Oh God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assail and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. We turn back to 1 Samuel. David has been on a journey, and it's a lot like Tom and Sharon's vacation, right? It's all been fun and games. Right? Sure. <laughs> so as we look back, this all became uh, actually at the end of uh, chapter 20. We had David and Jonathan out in the field, and Jonathan was shooting arrows. And why was he doing that? To give him a signal as to whether he could return or warn David whether Saul was still had death threats against David or not. And the answer was yes. get out of Dodge, right? And so then we started in uh, chapter 21. And where does David flee to first? Nope. Nob. Nob. And what's in Nob? Um, the tabernacle. So this is actually the tabernacle that they had carried with them through the wilderness. Uh, the the uh, Israelites have not taken Jerusalem and the temple has not been built. So Nob is a place that's like the worship center for now. And uh, the priest is there and David waltzes in. And um, what is he looking for from the priest at Nob? Bread. And what kind of bread does he get? Holy the holy bread. bread, the one that is in the presence of the Lord. Probably the one that was being replaced that day with fresh bread. Uh, it was there for a day, and then they took it down, and then the priest ate it. And uh, the priest that was there, uh, Ahimelech, um, is he kind of, what, what does he say to David when David shows up? What are you, what are you doing here, and, and why are you not here with a full contingent of soldiers? And uh, David tells him the truth, right? I'm on the run from Saul. Oh, he lies. lies. Oh, I had to go really quick. Me and my men were on a special mission. We had to go really quick. And oh, by the way, we need bread. And oh, by the way, do you have any, have any, do you have a sword here? And uh, Himalek is a little bit worried, wondering, but he believes him or appears to, gives him bread. And then what sword does he give him? Goliath. Goliath's sword. This would be the sword that uh, David way back when used to cut Goliath's head off. So David takes off and, and he's thinking really clearly, where does he go after that? Not the, the has, has to do with the sword of Goliath. Where does he go? Philistine. Yeah. Goes to Philistine, goes to Gath. And this is the hometown of Goliath. Goliath. And do people recognize him there? Yeah. Yeah, great, great, great. <laughs> and uh, remember that uh, that that song that people sang when David came back from killing Goliath. There was a song concerning David and Saul. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David killed his ten thousands. His ten thousands, and they remember that song. And so, was it a good idea for David to go there? No, no. Not really. And so, what does David do? Crazy. Acts crazy. And this is a continuing deception, right? Deception has been David's friend. Has deception worked well for him? No. 
in the short term, but not necessarily in the long term. And so here you have David, who was this general. In fact, you could say the highest general in Saul's army. And he's acting like a crazy man with spit running down his face and, and chewing on things. And uh, the Philistines necessarily want David with him? No. Nope. 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 So they take him out and leaves. And then where does he head? The cave of the Gollum. The cave of the Gollum. We'll uh, put a map on the screen and hopefully you'll be able to see it. So here's Gath, if you can see my uh, cursor on the screen. He escapes from there and he goes about 12 miles east to a Gollum. And this is kind of in the foothills and there's caves and he hides in a cave there. And uh, who comes to him in the cave? His family. Yeah. And why would his family come to him? Because they're hiding out too. Because they are his family, and who's probably after him? Saul. Saul. Saul's after him. And so, what does David do with his family? He takes them down and around over to Moab, which is a different country, and he has uh, them shelter there. Because of being a different country, Saul's not going to necessarily go in and invade there to look for one family. And you kind of get the idea that David's going to hang out there too, but what happens to move him along? Saul kills people. Hmm? Saul kills people. Yeah, Saul kills there, we had There was a prophet that came to him and said, no, you don't stay here. Go back into Judah. That sounds smart, right? Leave, leave this foreign country where Saul can't get you and go back to the place where Saul can't. But that's what God says. Now, has David had a history of always necessarily turning to God or listening to God for advice? No. What does he do here, though? He listens. He listens. Even though it doesn't make a lot of sense, and you could say, no, this is crazy. I'm safe here. I'm not going to do that. He does. He listens and he heads back. Then, uh, when when David was at the uh, at the uh, uh, the tabernacle. It was David and his men, but there was another guy hanging out there. Remember him? Dooge. Dooge was there. He's a shepherd for King Saul. And he witnesses David and his men getting the bread, and he witnesses David getting the sword. And uh, was he more or less like a spy? Kind of. Yeah. So uh, we have Saul. Uh, complaining that uh, he's discovered that even his son Jonathan has turned against him, um, warning David to leave. Uh, the wife, his daughter that he gave David uh, for a wife, she covered for him so he could escape. And so he's complaining that everybody's against him, his whole family is against him, all are conspiring with this guy who's trying to take the throne from him. And then dude steps up and goes, hey, I saw David. And guess what he did? And that brings who into, pro into trouble? Who gets in trouble from that? Priests. Priests. And the priest comes and said, hey, David's your man. You know, he's, he's fought. I, I assumed that what he said was right. And yeah, I helped him out. I gave him stuff. And does that please Saul? No. What does Saul do? Kills him all. Wants to kill him. Does Saul raise his hand against the priest? No, he tells him. Soldiers he tells the soldiers to. Do they do it? Yep. No. Oh, no. they didn't? No. Who did it, Dooch? Yeah. Dooch is a bad guy. He is. He, he, killed, he, he not only killed the head priest, Abiathar, who else does he kill? All the other priests, men and children and women and 86. And not all their families, everyone. Animals, too, did he? Animals, too. One man escapes, though. Do you remember who escaped? The son of the high priest. Yeah. Who is? The son of Ahimelech, um, who is uh, Abiathar. He escapes. He's, he's the only priest left, and he's wearing... Remember what he's wearing on his chest? I forget the name of it, but it's a thing that answers. 
Yes or no questions in back. Oh, yeah. Yep, it's got the Urim and the Thummim. So he can inquire of God for David. So now David has a direct means to speak to God and get advice from God. The Lord works through some horrible means to further his agenda and to help David out, doesn't he? How do you say that again? Urim and Thummim. 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 Then the next thing that happens in verse 23 is there's this town, uh, Kayla, and uh, the Philistines are attacking it. It's, uh, it's, it's the time of the harvest, right? And the Philistines are going to steal all the grain. And uh, David finds out, and David says, well, that's fine. Let's all take care of it, right? What does David do? He asked God if he should Asked him a couple times. And God says, yes. go. Yeah. And how does David do against him? He wins. He wins. And the town is happy and they throw a, a party for him and they, they say that they will shelter him from Saul, right? <clears throat> they don't. No. They throw him under the bus. <laughs> hey, Saul, guess who's here? The guy that had just saved them, saved their town, saved their lives, saved their crops. Yeah, they're going to throw him under the bus. And so David, being a soldier that he is, pulls out his sword and executes all of them, right? No, he leaves. No, he just leaves, quietly leaves. Saul finds out he's no longer there. He turns around and goes back home. Then uh, David is in the hill country at, uh, of Ziph, <clears throat> which is right up here on your screen. And somebody comes to him from Saul's family, but it's not Saul. Who is it? Jonathan. Jonathan. His, his friend Jonathan, who he made a covenant of love and brotherhood with. And uh, Jonathan comes to kill him, right? No. What, is, what does Jonathan do? Well, Jonathan being Jonathan, he probably told David to not dodge him. He gives him comfort. And strength. Do not fear that for the hand of Saul, my father shall not find you. <clears throat> you shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. He gives him strength and encouragement. He's kind of like a brother of the Lord who prays with him. And perhaps David had no idea how, I mean, it's been a while since he'd seen Jonathan. Did Jonathan still love him, care yep. for him? Yes. He does. David didn't know that, but now he does, doesn't he? This would have had been a, a pretty low moment in David's life. And just when he needed it the most, this guy who had stood by his side, who's actually Saul's son, loves him and has stayed by his side, is with him. It comes at the moment of need and cares for him. And that's kind of where we left off. Um, we're going to pick it up in uh, 1 Samuel 23 and start reading at verse 19. The one that would care to read. Then the Zephites went up to Saul at Eba, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds of Horish on the hill of Achilla? which is south of Jeshimon. Now, come down, O king, of course, for your heart's desire to come down. And, and our part shall be to surrender him unto the king's hand. And Saul said, may you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go make yet more sure. No one see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he is very cunning. See therefore and take note of all the working places where he hides, and come back to me with the sure information. Then I will go with you, and if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of in the 
Araba to the south of Deshema. And Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told, so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on the side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side of the mountain. David was hurrying to get away from Saul, and Saul and his men were closing in on David, and his men captured them. A messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing David, and went against the Philistines. Therefore, the place was called the Rock of Escape. David went up from there and lived in the strong holds of En Gedi. En Gedi. <clears throat> so, once again, what's happened to David? He's hiding out somewhere, and the people around there do what? to give him up, right? Does Saul automatically march with all his men to find him? He sends out like a search party. Because what's happened in the past when he's tried to uh, corner David? Yeah, David's a slippery kind of a guy, isn't he? So he sends some spies to go search out and let him know if he's there. And if he's there, he'll send the all of his forces. Uh, let's keep our fingers here for a moment. Let's turn to Psalm, Psalm 22. I don't think we've read this one yet, have we? How was David feeling at this time when uh, after all he'd done and he's hiding out and people keep giving up his locations to song? Well, perhaps this is a little bit of what it felt like. He's a little sad. Somebody want to read Psalm 22? My and as, God as, as, we, as we go through, look, look for ways that, God, or that David, despite how he's feeling, uh, verbalizes his respect for the Lord and his trust in him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You are so far from saving me from the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. We'll stop for a moment. That first verse, why is that so familiar? Well, in the season of Lent, Christ on the cross. Yeah, Christ quoted these from the cross, didn't he? And so a lot of things in this psalm express not only David, but express what Christ was going through. Okay, go ahead. Rhonda. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have seen my God. But not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of fashion, surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like what is that? Not sure. Not sure. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. They lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. 
I can count on my bones. They stare, gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. I'll stop there this for a moment. The crucifixion of Christ. Absolutely. Yes. David wrote this, but very much so. I mean, David is, is verbalizing how he feels. Um, but this suffering actually was played out completely physically and emotionally by Jesus on the cross. So it starts out with a plea at the beginning, right? The first couple of verses is David crying out and also Jesus crying out. My God, my God. So what does it feel like? It feels all alone to come to Jesus. You ever felt like that? You know that that happens even to Christians, even to believers. There's times when it feels like God's not there. He's not helping. He's not answering. These are times of trial and testing. David, the man after God's own heart, felt like it didn't. I cry out day by day, but you do not answer. And then in verses 3, 4, and 5, how does it shift? Praising God. Yeah. You're, you're the Holy One. And fa my father's trusted you and he delivered them. You, you rescued everyone. It's a statement of faith, isn't it? So despite the fact it doesn't feel like the Lord is, is with me now or helping me, he's remembering that that's not always been the case. God is a God that watches over and helps and protects us. Is that something that we can do when we're feeling like God has abandoned us? Remember all the times in the past when you cried out, he was there, he answered your cry. How many years were they in Israel and Egypt before God took them out? Mm -hmm. Generations. Mm -hmm. So 280, I think, something like that. So it's like we always want it to happen right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, very much so. And then he, uh, after, after stating that, that fact of faith, he goes on and he says uh, in the verse uh, six, but I am a worm and not a man. So how is that? How does the psalm shift again? Kind of pity on me. Yeah. Even though you've been faithful in the past, what about now? I'm ground out in the dirt. goes on to talk about uh, um, so you have you have this complaint once again about how he's feeling. It shifts again in verse 9. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. On you I was cast from birth. Be not far from me for trouble is near. So how has he shifted gears again? Kind of plays it down again. Recognizing that God has been with him in the past, from the very point of my birth. Yeah, like God has chosen them and selected them. And they have an awareness that there are other things in store for me, but boy, right now, I don't see it. Right. But it's there. I, I can look back in my lifetime and see it, right? There's a plan. Yeah. That statement, <laughs> uh, yet you are he who took me from the womb. Yeah. On you I was cast at birth. Is that only true of David? No. Who is it true of? All of us. Every, each and every one of us. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> now we get into uh, verse 12. Bulls of Bashan. Bashan was an area that was in the north. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a rich pasture land. So David, David is uh, speaking of uh, these animals that are all kind of attacking him. This is all figurative language, it's poetic language. And it was for Christ too, but it, it describes how he felt. Look at verse 14. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. Continue on. My heart is like wax that is melted within my breast. 
This is not a physical thing David is feeling, but it's emotional that he's describing. But what, how about what Jesus said? It's totally physical. Yeah. All my bones are out of joint. Can you imagine what it was like hanging on the cross with, with your bones out of joint? Yeah. Just that enough is painful. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You ever been so, so thirsty that your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth? And you lay me in the dust of death. Not dead yet, but I'm pretty darn close. David was feeling this. Jesus experienced it. Body, soul, and spirit. And as one of you said, uh, this is this is David writing so, so far, you know, um, what was it? A thousand years before Christ would experience it. Um, they have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. I can't tell you exactly how David, what David was experiencing emotionally, but it was all the Holy Spirit looking forward to what would happen for Jesus. Interesting how Jesus voices the first line of this psalm. And if you're a good Israelite or a good Jew, you know the rest. And so he says the first line. But all the rest you can see happening to him as he hangs on the cross. He's referencing that on purpose. The, the Gospels don't get into feelings a lot with Jesus on the cross. It's pretty much just strictly here's the facts but you want to know the feelings and that's why we read through the scripture on the good friday here's how jesus felt and here's the agony of body soul and spirit he was going through so when jesus was on the cross when he bore our grief and carried our sorrow we go right back and see the sorrow and the grief that david experienced and yet christ took all of that from David and from all of us on him on the cross. Yeah. So that's that link. Yeah. Yes. So was, was was David David suffering his punishment for sin back then? We all who, Christ, Christ, we have the, the Christ, suffering. Christ 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 Christ. Who who suffered God's wrath for David's sin, for Jesus his lying? Christ. Everything else Jesus did. Here it all is poured on him. Make the word I have you leave off. Nineteen. Continue on. But you, O oh God, Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild ox. Okay, we've shifted again here. What is shifted in the psalm here now? He's pleading for his. Like Plead, pleading for God to come and rescue him because God is powerful enough. So is, is David's uh, and, and, he, and even Jesus, is their faith being shaken? Are, are, they, are they turning away from God? No. In no. the midst of all this? No. He's shaken but not turning away. He's, yeah. just, he's just hoping he's going to do it sooner rather than later. It's, it's an honest expression of what's going on in David's life and also in Jesus' life. But when these kind of things are happening to us, where do we sometimes turn? Away from God. Mm -hmm. Don't we? Yeah. Turn to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Turn to something else to take our mind off of it, whether it be drink or drugs or whatever it may be. And where does David turn? To God. To God. Can you voice honest prayers to God about yes. where you're at and how you're feeling? Yeah. God already knows what you're feeling in your heart. That's a great thing to do. If you can't pour it out to anybody else, you can pour it out to him. All right, where did I have you leave off? Thank you. Verse 22. Uh, yep. I will tell you of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. 
All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he was not hit, he has not hidden his face from him, but he has but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. How is it how have we shifted again in this part? He's praising him. Yeah, despite everything that's going on, all that he suffered, I will praise you, Lord. And why? Verse 24. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction but of the afflicted. And not hidden his face. He cares. He's Even though it might not seem like it to you where you're at right now, he cares and he loves you so very much. And he feels your pain. And in case you ever wonder about that, once again, think about Jesus suffering on the cross. He knows how it feels to suffer physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And in the midst of all this, David can stop and praise the Lord. All right, Faith, you go ahead and finish it up. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May our heart, your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kinship belongs to the Lord and he rules over nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Prosperity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to the people yet unborn that he has done it. So he ends this psalm with what? Looking forward to what kind of a time? The future. And how, prosperous future. Yeah. A future when all of this suffering and stuff will be passed. If that was true of David, if Jesus is the subject, the real subject of the psalm, what was Jesus looking forward to? Going, to, going up to God. Well, let's go a little bit beyond that. It does have to do with the resurrection. Saving us from our sins. Yeah. What is what is the resurrection a harbinger of? A foretaste of the feast to come, which is heaven, eternal life. I like to separate heaven from eternal life because heaven we often use that's where our souls go to be with Jesus. That's not the end. That's not the end all be all. We're looking forward to eternal life. It, this most clearly describes eternal life, doesn't it? The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the problems that we experience now will be gone. gone. It references all the rich of the earth will feast and worship and all who go down to the dust will kneel before him. When Jesus returns on the last day, will it only be the believers that bow before him? No. no. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody shall bow. Even those who pierced him? Yes. Who cried out for his death? Those people that afflict the church? Evil people like our buddy Putin, will he have to bow before Christ? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, he will. Questions or comments on this? Well, David started out with a real doubter at the beginning <laughs> and processed through it with God. And how did it end up on the end? Was he still like, As a I give up? <laughs> I, you know, was, was he still yeah. down, do you think, at the very end? No. What he was saying? No. No. 
That's a great catch. I like how you said that. He, he processed through it. But God processed through it with David. He, yes. God was with him. He started out very bad, terrible, terrible. But in the end, how did he feel after he talked with God? Is that true of us when we oh, yeah. when we talk things out with other friends, with Christian friends? Is it good to talk out your problems? Yeah. Feel better, especially if they have problems in the kids' room. Yeah, but but even if you don't, if, if you're if you if you're just struggling in a low place in your life, if you can find a good Christian friend to bear your heart to, they may not be able to give you any solid advice. But doesn't it just feel good to? Get it, off your chest. get it off your chest. What's something you should never do if somebody is getting it off their chest? Interrupt them. Yeah, Reverend Art, good, good. Interrupt them. Story top. Story top. What is the story top? This is bad. <laughs> Very good. You think this is bad. Let me tell you. Did we ever do that? Mm -hmm. All the time. All the time. And, and when you're just sitting around having a beer, or you're sitting around the campfire talking, there's, there's a place for that. But when somebody's bearing their heart and soul to you, don't ever do that. How does it, you ever had somebody do that to you? When you're telling something that's very, very tender to you in your life, that you still have strong emotions over and somebody story tops you, how does that make you feel? unimportant yeah like like this thing that i'm all churned up about that it's consumed my life really isn't that big of a thing because he's had it far worse even if it's something that brought you great joy and somebody story tops you it can kind of make that joy maybe not as important yeah have you ever not shared things with people because they do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's things I've held back from certain people because I don't want them to do that story topic thing. Mm -hmm. The judging. The judging of it? That judging of it and give them their own opinion. Because yeah. many times I don't share things with people because I really don't need to hear your opinion or your judgment. So you keep it on the box. So the safest place is to have that dialogue even when you're talking to yourself in the room is to ask because nobody's judging you and giving your opinion. He he won't story top you, will he? No. Even though he easily he could. could. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an excellent point, <laughs> yeah. um, Chrissy. He he and why doesn't he judge you? He loves me. Who did he judge in your place? Jesus. He has no wrath over you anymore. He knows what I did or didn't do anyway. And when, when sin overtakes us and we feel convicted and guilt, he doesn't want us to lay in that. He comes alongside us and impresses upon us, you're forgiven for it all, everything. I talk to myself a lot, don't judge. <laughs> Best place we can turn is to God, isn't it? Honest prayers. All right, where did I have us leave off when we were reading through? 24. Is it 24? Okay, who was reading? Okay. I think it was 26. I can't even remember or no, we I think we made it all the way through, didn't we? We made it all the way through. I'm yeah, sorry. We made it. Okay. All right. So in, in the in that last part, verses 26 to 29, we have something interesting happening. Saul's there with his soldiers, and they're going up one side of a mountain. And where's David? Yeah, on the other side. <laughs> and eventually, perhaps if nobody had done anything. Saul's army might have surrounded him. What, who and what intervenes to protect that? 
Philistines attack the Just by chance? No. No. So who is it brought that all about? God. God. God brings the Philistines in. They're attacking. So Saul has to stop and go take care of them. And he's able to get out of there and go hang up in the strongholds of En Gedi. And En Gedi is a mountainous region that's right next to the Dead Sea. And that's the place eventually King Herod, much later on during Jesus' time, he'll build a fortress up there. And it was said to be impenetrable because this, 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 the cliffs were so steep. And you could see somebody coming and you could roll rocks and stuff down on them if they tried to scale it. Anyway, story for another time. Let's turn to our uh, study guide now. Any any comments or questions on anything we've studied so far? Let's say. We're on day two of our study guide because we've just been cruising along so fast through this. Happening. So we've read through Psalm 21, 23, and uh, question six, David is constantly on the run. There is but a step between me and death. He is pursued and threatened by his enemies and defended and protected by his friends. David's survival tactics waver between faith and folly. So we're going to review a couple instances here, and we need to figure out, do these instances, these acts in David's life, do they represent him acting on faith or acting on folly, which would be not trusting in God, unbelief. So let's turn back to uh, chapter 21 and read verses 1 to 9. First Samuel 21, 1 to 9. Somebody want to read those verses? David came to Nob, priest, and came to meet David trembling and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with the matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. The priest answered him, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. For the young men have kept themselves from men. For if, if the young men have kept themselves from women, and David answered the priest, Truly, women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will the vessel be holy? So the priest gave them the holy bread, for there is no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from it before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Judge, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Then David said to Ahimelech, "Then have you here? Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand?" For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, but there is none but that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. This is not a black and white thing. In here, you're in here. You may find in these in these verses we look at, there could be both faith and folly at the same time. So let's start with David coming to Nob. Faith or folly? Folly. 
coming in this power of faith, he was going to God. Yeah. When you're on the run, when the king's after you, it was a great place to turn, wasn't it? And to the priest. How about what happened after that? Verse, verses two and after. Faith or follow? Follow. You're lying to the priest. But at this time, I call it interesting to think that God had that authority be there. He had that person from Saul. Mm -hmm. As it says that, how did he? Yeah, dudes just happened to be there. No, detained before the Lord. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not really sure that's not really explained other than perhaps he had performed a vow and was waiting to make a certain sacrifice or a ritual. Yeah, he's there on other business. And he's, so he ends up being an eyewitness. And once again, David's lie not only affects himself, it affects everybody else. And with a douge there, it's going to end up costing the life of the priest, isn't it? And not just the priest, who else is it going to cost? Hmm? The families, the yeah. children, the oxen. Everybody. Big thing of folly, wasn't it? <laughs> then we're asked to look at, uh, turn to chapter 23. And look at verses 6 to 23. Well, you know what? Um, that Matthew 12, 3 to 4, uh, that has to do with the bread. Do you guys remember that? We read that when we read through. Let's turn there anyway. Turn to Matthew. Uh, let's go to Matthew 12, 3 to 4 first. Read one to eight. Matthew 12. 12, one to eight. Mm -hmm. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests of the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Disciples are walking through the grain fields, they're hungry, and it's the Sabbath. And so what is the Pharisees' problem with the disciples? They're working. They're working. They're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And Jesus cites David, and this would be important because how do you think the Pharisees feel about David? The Pharisees, David, he's the man. Oh, that's right. He's the man. Uh, from They know from David's line is going to come the Messiah, the king of Israel, who they're thinking of as a temporal king. David's the man. And so Jesus is pointing out this guy who you think is the man. Does he observe the law like you do? No. No. I don't think they exactly observe the law. He ate the bread of the presence. They're looking at the letter. Yes. And does God look at the letter of the law? The, 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 this whole thing centers on verse 7. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, mercy not sacrifice. So more important of the letter of the law is mercy, mercy and love. In other places, uh, Jesus comments that the uh, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so God set this Sabbath aside for what purpose? Why did he want men to rest? Worship him. Worship him and have rest and rejuvenation, right? That's important for our health. And why is... Why do we, why would we refrain from taking a day off of work? 
What would move us to do that? Money. Yeah, money. We can work on Sunday. Matter of fact, I can get double time and a half on Sunday. And I can work more than eight hours. I can work 12, 15 hours. Is that good? No. No. And then again, some companies, it's like, hey, that's, that's the job you have to do. It. Is it for you to do it or you don't have a job? That's true. Most companies give you at least one day, one day off. This is so much anymore. So was it really, was it, was it, was that faith or folly that David took and ate the bread of the crust? Faith. Faith. Yeah. Okay. Let's turn back to First uh, Samuel 23. First Samuel 23, read verses 6 to 23. When Abathur, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah, and Saul said, God has given him into my hand. If he had shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars, and Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abathar, the priest, bring the ephod here. He then said, David, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant, has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they would go. When Saul was told that David escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition, and David remained in the strongholds of the wilderness in the hill country of the wilderness of Zip. And Saul saw him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. So far, faith or folly on David's part? <coughs> faith. Faith. faith, because where does he turn? To God. To God. To God. He doesn't turn to his own means. He doesn't lie. He turns to God and then does what God tells him to do. What doesn't he do to the people of Keilah? He doesn't do destroy them. <laughs> yeah. He's got 600 men. If he wanted to go crazy on them, he probably could have. I mean, here they are. He saved their city and now they're going to turn him over. That would make you pretty angry, wouldn't it? But he takes off. Yep, faith. Um, and we're actually supposed to read through to uh, verse 23. So now read 15 to 23. And Saul pursues David. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph and Horsh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horsh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horish, and Jonathan went home. Then the Ziphites went up to Saul and Gib at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds of Horish, on the hill of Hakala, which is south of just Simon, now come, now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire, to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go make yet more sure. Go and see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there. For it has told me that he is very cunning. See therefore, and take note of all the lurking places where he hides. And come back to me with sure information. 
then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. Okay. And they it's until 23. At the head of Saul. Yeah. I, I don't know why we had to read that far because uh, I don't, yeah. But anyway, that's what they said. So let's go back. What happens when David is hiding out in the wilderness of Ziph? Who comes to him? Jonathan. Faith or folly? Faith. Faith. On the part of Jonathan, especially, maybe? Yeah. Can you imagine if Saul found out he went to meet David? Or if, if Saul had him follow? And what is, uh, what, is, what is Jonathan's purpose there? What does he do? Yeah, verse 16, strengthen his hand in God. Strengthen his hand in God. What were they doing, David and Jonathan? Praying. Praying. It goes back to what you were saying earlier about a friend having big troubles and another friend listening and going to step we didn't talk about before, praying with that person, saying, let's pray together. Praying, yeah. praying and worshiping, yeah. maybe encouraging one another, not just, hey, it'll be okay, not just meaningless platitudes, but statements based on who God is and what he has done in the past and what he will do in the future. All those things were in that psalm we read, right? Mm -hmm. Honest complaints, but then a reminder of how powerful God is how steadfast his love is. What else, what surprising things does Jonathan tell David here? Verse 70. That Saul won't do it. More than that. He will be king in the I will be second in command. I know. That Saul knows. Yeah, Saul and so yeah, Saul knows that. But Jonathan, said, Jonathan assures him and said, I know. And, and why, why will David be king? Yeah, he's God's anointed. And it'll happen right after this, right? <laughs> Isn't that how we want things, though? Mm -hmm. no, it'll happen in God's time. It will happen. And so one of the things that Jonathan communicates is faith and trust and patience. I use that word covenant there too. Covenant's a big deal, isn't it? It's not just like, hey, high five, we'll shake our I think I think a covenant is really, really between them and God. So it's 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 I've got a lot of power and meaning in it. Yes. We, we don't take that lightly. It's not a covenant. No. It's 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 a promise before the Lord in the presence of the Lord. And so you could say marriage is a covenant. Yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah. And part of their agreement is uh, what, what, what is part of this covenant that we're told about? Back in verse 17. You shall be king over Israel and... Is that, is that Jonathan demanding anything? Because who should be king after Saul? Jonathan. And so what is he telling David? I know that you're the chosen one and I'll be your second. Which means Jonathan won't kill him. Huh? Won't kill him. Yeah. Won't, won't vie for that position. I will bow before you, David. I'll be your advisor. I'll be your support. I'll be there for you forever. Kind of thing. Unfortunately, Jonathan, as we read on, he's not going to have a chance to do that. Not because he doesn't want to. Great tragedy, not only ahead, not only for Saul, but for Jonathan, too. Good. Uh, <clears throat> comments or questions on this? We're asked to turn to chapter 21, verses 10 to 15, and look at this, whether it's faith or folly. Somebody already read 21 verses uh, 10 through 15? 
That day, David Locke, who was still fleeing from Saul, when he came to the king of Achish, okay, Achish's officers asked, isn't this David, the king of his country, isn't he the one they used to sing the song about, sing about in the dances? Saul has defeated thousands, but David tens of thousands. When David realized what they had said, he was terrified of Achish of hate. So he changed his behavior. When he was in the presence and acted insane, as long as he was under their authority, he scribbled on the doors of the city gate and let his stick run down his beard. Achish said to his officers, look at him. Don't you see that he's insane? Why bring him to me? Do I have such a shortage of lunatics that you bring this man <laughs> so that he can show me he's insane? Does this man have to come into my house? <laughs> Is there humor in scripture or not? <laughs> so, uh, faith or folly, guys? Faith. Faith on whose part? David's. It was a folly on his part because he should have never went. Should have never went there. You know, and, and, and David is an intelligent guy, but darn it all. You've got the dude's sword. And, and you go to his hometown. And it's the Philistines. And Israel's been at war with the Philistines and continues to be. Now, you can understand, well, you go to the enemy, cross the enemy lines, and maybe Saul won't find you. But you don't go to the hometown of the guy you killed, their right. champion. What, what, what should David have done that would have turned this whole uh, thing to faith? What's that? Not yeah, not go, but, he, but he's there. He prayed. He should have prayed. prayed. Turn to God. God's yeah. advice. Yeah. Work through it as you like to say. <laughs> and um, so here you have David, who is a respect, we said before, a respectable man acting crazy. Crazy. I like lunatic, by the way. Yeah. Lunatic. <laughs> I like especially how your translation said, Katie. Shortage of lunatics. <laughs> Do I know what and why, why would the king be so quick to latch on to David being crazy? What, what would he maybe know about Saul? He probably figured he was crazy too. It, isn't this whole focus on killing David, isn't that the sign of somebody who's deranged? His anger and his need to uh, get rid of David consumes him. As we said before, is it affecting the way that uh, that, that Saul is ruling Israel? Oh, yes. One of the reasons why David has these 600 men that came to him is because people are dissatisfied with how things are going. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, we've got one more. Uh, chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers, all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. He became captain over them, and they were with him, about 400 men. David sent from there, and David went from there to Mitzvah of Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and my mother stay with you until I know that God will do for me what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then, then the prophet had said to David, do not remain in the stronghold, depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Herod. Faith or folly in this section? Well, faith because God said he listened and did it. He listened and did it. Also that he cared about and took in his family right. and found a place for him to hide. I mean, it is his family, but he could have said, you know, I got enough problems. What are you doing bothering me? Cares for them, loves them, finds a place. And then even though it makes more sense to say in Moab, he listens to the prophet Gad and goes back. Comments or questions? Was Moab uh, enemy against 
against uh, at any time? Yes. Or are they just neighbors? They were neighbors. They had they have been at war in the past, but I don't get the sense that they were at this time. I mean, they're they're ancient. They're ancient. Uh, there's a connection there. Um, as somebody mentioned uh, last week, uh, Ruth. Right. Ruth was, was a Moabite. Moabite. Yeah. And who it, and she is in the lineage of Christ. Yeah. Um, I think Moab, if I'm not mistaken, uh, those were descendants of Lot, Abraham's uh, nephew. There's there's a there's a connection with the Israelites, uh, not direct, but. Are there any relatives then to Ruth? There in Moab. Yeah, yeah, because Ruth is a Moabite. Yeah, but it, it's it's quite far removed. I mean, I don't think David at this point could show up and say, "Hey, I'm a descendant of Ruth. <laughs> Help my family." That's a little bit too far gone from that. It's, it's a different country, so I don't think Saul would be able to just march in. But but they're not at war. They're not, they're at, war. not at war. The, but, the, <coughs> go ahead, Tom. But Saul probably had some kind of respect for, for Moab because it wasn't like, well, he followed David in there. I'll just follow him right in there. We'll just march in there and right. bring him back. He, yeah. he stayed out of there out of some kind of, a, not maybe not fear, but out of a Maybe some kind of a truce over. Well, you, you know, you don't have endless armed forces, so you have to pick your battles. Moab was not part of one of the nations that God wanted the Israelites to clear out. They weren't part of the promised land. That was separate. The Philistines, on the other hand, they're smack dab in the land that God promised to them. And they were one of the nations that Israel should have faithfully cleared out, and they did not. Saul appears to be overextended at this time. Remember, his right hand guy, David, is no longer 100% fighting the battles for Saul. Okay. Saul's had difficulties, family problems, everything. His people are starting to wonder about his sanity. He, he just practically was overextended anything. Okay. Right. He's, he's, not, he's not focused on even the Philistines so much, only when he has to be. Yeah. Right? He's all about, let's find David, let's kill David, kill David, kill David, kill David, kill David. And when you have a leader of a country who focuses on one thing, they're respectful of anything else, what happens? It's not good. Like what's going on. <laughs> uh, question seven, David wrote many Psalms. We went through each one of these psalms as we read through uh, our readings from 1 Samuel. And, you know, the most important thing is, is uh, you notice how in each one of these psalms, if you remember, there's the complaint. But then it's not just a complaint. It moves on to a cry for help, a faithful cry for help. And then it winds up with praise and thanksgiving mm -hmm. that the Lord will rescue me. And the Lord does love me. And the Lord is all powerful. And I entrust myself into your hands. And that's true through a lot of David's Psalms, even Psalm 51, which is David's confession of sin with Bathsheba. It winds up at the end, he winds up saying, I will praise your name and I will tell others about your love and faithfulness. He poured his soul out to, to the Lord in confession and he receives the forgiveness, the absolution and when we receive the forgiveness and absolution, it moves us to praise. Process we use in worship, we receive in the sacraments where we confess our sins and woe is me and I really end up receiving God's spirit and putting it forth. There, there's a reason why we do process. confession and absolution at the beginning of the worship service. Because right. after the absolution, what do we begin to do? Praise him, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. Praise and worship the God who sent his son to die for our sins and remove them. Mm -hmm. And that fact should lift up our hearts and minds to praise him. Um, question 7b. What insights on your own life do you gain as you look at David's life and the way that God dealt with David?
Felix gives God the credit. David gives God the credit. Think of think it from the aspect of how God dealt with David. How did God deal with David throughout all these things? He's right there with him. Yeah. Was that Norma? Even when he goofs. Even when he goofs. <laughs> kind of showed compassion. Great compassion. Even when it looked like that God wasn't present, was he? Yes. How about when David did something really stupid like go to Gath? He's still watched out. David, David, David. Kind of like my prayers in the evening before I go to sleep. Boy, did I do something dumb. I'm so embarrassed. What was that stupid? Oh, God, forgive me. I'm really sorry. By the time I work all through that, it ends up on a high and I can go to sleep. Was, did, did David escape from Gath because he was a successful actor? <laughs> Essentially, no. what could have happened? He could have been killed, but yeah. God had plans for him. So. Dude, I, I have enough lunatics here. <laughs> Cut this lunatic's head off. <laughs> Tom, do you have something? I was going to say, I think our lives are roller coasters. It, we're not a constant. God is constant, but ours is really a little bit up and down and, and just crazy. But God is constant. You have a one line that, all right, so whether you're on a high or low, I'm still here. Good. Question 8, 20, read verses 23, 15 to 18. That's Jonathan coming and, and, and giving comfort and strength and worshiping with David. So you know, we don't need to, we've already kind of talked about that, how David was encouraged by the visit of his good friend, who he had already made a covenant of friendship before, right? When they departed after the incident of the arrows in the field, they solidified a covenant of friendship and it's renewed here. So with that in mind, 8b, Think of someone who has helped you strengthen your hand in God during difficult times. What uh, what did that person say or do that was meaningful to you? Ever been a time in your life when you were down and out and worried or sick or distressed? Pastor? You hear me? Reverend Art. Okay, when I was first widowed, when my first wife was killed, Margie had just been divorced for no means from her husband. She came to my house to comfort me and bring me a devotional. And I would read that in the morning during my uh, time of mourning. And I would open that up and read that. And it's a, it's a CPH little prayer book. And we were friends before this at church. I mean, we were, but she brought that and that meant so much to me. And then years later, we got back together and got married. But that uh, member of the congregation just coming over me and handing me that prayer book and saying, this helped me, you know, when she got divorced and she gave that to me. That was a great comfort for months. I would open it, if it's on my bedstand, I'd open it up every morning and read one of those devotions. And they were all part of Psalms of the, uh, David's asking for strength and God giving it to him. And they were, they were the Psalms. And that was a wonderful thing that that, that member of the church did. When, when somebody has taken the time out to come to you and spend time with you, and pray with you and care for you. Was it a sacrifice on their part in any way? Yes. Yes. Are we called to provide that same thing to others around us? Yes. It's we the only, same comfort when people send me cards. When we only do that when we, have, when we have time on our schedule? No. Yep. Well, we do, but we shouldn't. We should. We should make time, shouldn't we? 
make time to visit people in the hospital. Right now, that's kind of an impossibility with uh, restricted visiting because of COVID, but when it ever opens up, should we? Is a pastor the only one that should visit people in the hospital or the no. nursing homes? No. The only one to call people when they're sick and check on them? No. no. Send cards to them? No. I have people that do that regularly, and I sure appreciate it. Jerry Bergeron calls me once a week. That's awesome. Wherever he's at. He just talked to me yesterday. He'll be coming home early, a day early. Part of, uh, part of being a good brother or sister in Christ is to look around at your fellow members and how can I be uh, a Jonathan to them, right? How can I be a hand of the Lord, a hand of comfort, a hand of strength? And once again, do you need to have a whole bunch of wisdom to impart to them when you go to visit them? No. What do you need to be? An ear. Two listening ears, right? And just pray. Any comments or questions on anything that we've talked about today? Good study? Yes, very good. We made it through day made it through day two. We'll pick up with uh, we'll read through first Samuel 24 to 25 next time, and then uh, hopefully have time to work on the questions. Okay. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, there are people around us who are hurting. Make us Jonathan to them. Move us to give up some of our time, to spend time with them, to pray with them, whether it's on the phone or in person. And Lord, move us to give honest prayers to you when we're hurting, to turn to you and bear our hearts to you. But then remember all of the ways in the past that you lifted us up and helped us and move forward with faith and trust that you will do so again. That even when it feels like you're not present, and you're not doing anything, we know by faith that you are. You're always at work for our best, both now and in eternal life to come. Go with us, we leave this place, that we might be Jonathans to others, that we might be good Christian brothers and sisters who depend on you always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, everyone. Hi, Joe. Bye, Joe. Bye, 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 Reverend Art. Bye. Have a blessed day. See you tonight. Very good.